One last example of chirality I'll give that's actually somewhat interesting to me is the example of helical chirality. So you take, imagine we take a double bond and we put on it very bulky groups, such as the fluorinyl group, which I'm drawing for you here. If we do that and then we put something on the other end of the double bond, so big itself that it can't, it leaves this bond forced to adopt kind of a non-planar geometry. Remember, we would expect that double bond to be planar on the basis of sp2 hybridization and trigonal planar geometry that we've learned about. But if we stick another fluorinyl on here, what you should see is that there is no plane of symmetry in this molecule, and it is indeed chiral. So the mirror image would be non-superimposable on this guy. And if we looked at it kind of on a head-on view this way, what you would see is that the fluorinyl plane would look like this, the bottom fluorinyl plane, I should say, and then the top fluorinyl plane would look like this, kind of in the background. And this is actually, assuming it's substituted, I should say, not superimposable on its mirror image. So I would invite you to think about the mirror image of this. Maybe try drawing the mirror image upon reflection and see if you get the same results and see if you can see why this is a chiral compound. So next time we'll talk about some more detailed um, examples of uh, stereogenic or chiral compounds and we'll also take a look at the physical basis of chirality and its physical importance both in terms of optical activity as well as the interactions of chiral molecules which can play a very important role in for instance biology where many of the molecules that make up biological systems such as peptides, DNA, <clears throat> excuse me, enzymes and the like are all made up of chiral constituents. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.